I'm just late. Today we're going to be discussing continuation betting on the turn, specifically when deep stacked. This is a spot a lot of people mess up, and I want to make sure you do not mess it up. So we're going to go through some basic concepts, and then we're going to discuss continuation betting, and if we have time, we'll discuss combating continuation bets. So what is a turn continuation bet? First things first, this is when the flop aggressor continues betting on the turn. This means you raise pre-flop or somebody raised and you called on the flop either you bet or they checked you bet and they called so you had to be the aggressor on the flop then on the turn we're deciding if we should keep betting and typically if there is a bet and a call on the flop that means that the better usually has either their entire range or a somewhat polarized range right but the caller very importantly has something, right? Because they'll fold if they have garbage. So that means that if you bet the flop and your opponent calls, you're usually going to be betting pretty polarized on the turn, right? Because as equities become closer and closer, you should be betting with just your best hands and your draws for the most part, plus a few, you know, really junky draws. So always think about how the turn card interacts with your range and your opponent's range. And you're going to find that the type of card that comes on the turn is usually going to influence your strategy a lot. And there are some common situations that occur that once you figure out how to play these common spots, you'll be able to figure out how to extrapolate that to all sorts of common scenarios. So turn cards need to be an over card, a card that completes a draw, a card that pairs the board, or just a total blank. Louis Philippe. And the Sharks of PokerCoaching.com says, shout out to Kelly and Sam for both winning $13,000 during the weekend. Wow, good job, good work. Also, shout out to Saeed for winning your first tournament for $1,800. Nice job, nice job. I actually did not get to play poker this weekend because I'm going to Las Vegas tomorrow for about two weeks. If you're there, make sure you say hi. Um, I will be playing at the Poker Go Studio in the, I think it's called U.S. Poker Open. I think a final table, the main event of that last year, is a $50,000 tournament, I think. Does that sound right? Sounds right. Um, so that's going to be a lot of fun. What's the latest NFT alpha? The latest NFT alpha is my new NFT series that just launched a few days ago called Deck of Degeneracy. And want me to tell you the alpha? Every $10,000 buying tournament I play this year, and there's going to be a bunch of them, I'm going to draw a card out of a deck of cards. Just like this. I will shuffle the deck and I will draw a card and it'll be this one. Whoever has the three of diamonds, in this case, because that's what I drew, will get 1% of the next tournament I play. The only exception is the Super High Roller Bowl. We're only giving away half a percent of that one times 50. There are 50 copies of each card. Okay? But if you think about it, half a percent of a $300,000 buying tournament is $1,500. We're just giving that away to the people who have that. You can actually mint the cards right now for 0.1 Ethereum. I know a lot of you are new to NFTs. A lot of you don't care about NFTs. But view this as a membership club to the Jonathan Little fan club. Also, we have the Sweet Art by Wes Henry. We'll be airdropping bonus NFTs. We will be giving away pieces of my action. And it's going to be a lot of fun. So, you can currently mint these cards. They cost 0.1 ETH, which is about 250 bucks. You may say, $250 for a card with a monkey on it? That's ridiculous. But the utility, in my mind, is what you are actually buying. And we have roughly 50-ish or so of these giveaways happening over the course of the next year. We'll evaluate how the project's doing after that. If there's a bunch of secondary sales, we'll have a bunch more money to continue giving back to all of you. Is there a training utility attached? We will uh, do drawings every once in a while for poker coaching memberships, but I want to make sure we're giving back actual things of clear monetary value, right? Or at least equity, right? As we see, 800 of these things have been Locked up so far, but you can still get in. You can check it out at deckofdegeneracy.com. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're revealing all the cards on, um, well, tomorrow. And then you'll be able to buy specific cards on OpenSea. But I think I think you're going to find that anytime some utility gets attached to a card, like, uh, you know, I draw a card. We got the random eight of hearts. Eight of hearts is the good one this time. That card's going to spike. So, yeah, you know, mint some, have fun, enjoy yourself. I made this project to be the project I wish I had. One where you can have some sweats. The sweats actually matter, right? Because if you get 
1% of me in this upcoming $50,000 buying tournament, that's a $500 sweat, right? It's a lot of fun. I made it to where um, you don't have to like pay attention all the time, otherwise you miss out. I made it to where um, you didn't have to like play nonsense games or whatever in order to get stuff, right? I made this to be a project that Jonathan Little would love to have. As I did with PokerCoaching.com. If you like PokerCoaching.com, that's the training site I wish existed. And it didn't, so I made it. This is the NFT project I wish existed, but it didn't, so I made it, right? And, um, you know, if you like having pieces of my action, this is the way to do it. But yeah, lots of tournaments I'm playing this year. It's going to be a few hundred thousand dollar buying tournaments. We have the World Series main event. We have um, this tournament series coming up, the U.S. Poker Open. I think I'm playing about $180,000 in tournaments, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Check it out, deckofdegeneracy.com. That is how you're going to get my action over the course of the next year if you want it. That's it. Get it before it runs out. All right. Um, that's the NFT alpha. <laughs> Nick says, you're ready for that reveal. Hope I'm well. I hope you all are well too. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate all of you. If you're enjoying this show, click like, click subscribe. So let's say you get a turn card that's good for the continuation betters equity. What happens then? Well, in that spot, you're going to be betting more frequently. Whenever you get a good turn card that usually gives you a large nut advantage or a big range advantage, you're going to keep betting. Because essentially on those cards, the equity does not shift quite as much. So say you raise early position in the big blind calls and the flop comes king 8-4. You're probably going to bet that flop with basically your entire range. Okay? When it turns an ace, all of your misses on the flop are going to be a lot of ace-x hands, right? So now your opponent's going to fold out some random ace highs and stuff, so they don't have a whole lot of aces, but you have a lot of aces. So this is a spot where you're going to want to be betting very frequently. What about when it's just like a random overcard? Well, again, if you're betting 8-5-2 with stuff like king-queen, king-jack, king-10, king-9, king's pretty good for you, right? And your opponent's going to fold out all those hands. So that's another spot you're going to be betting frequently. Also, when you have a large nut advantage, if it's something like ace-queen-10-jack, we well, have a whole lot of king-x in your range when you raise like under the gun, so that's going to be a really good card for you as well. Neutral turns, in these scenarios, you're usually going to be mixing, betting, and checking. These are usually when you do have some nuts in your range, but you also have a whole lot of junk too. And in these scenarios, you're usually going to be you know, betting relatively polarized, but you know, still decently often. So typically this happens when the top card pairs on a low board, because you would continuation bet with a lot of your top pairs, or on complete blanks, like ace, jack, five, two, because you would bet all of your ace, x, and the two does not help your opponent's range at all. So that's the spot where you're going to keep betting very frequently. And then on bad turns, you are usually going to do a ton of checking. This is usually when the middle or bottom card pairs, because very often you will not continuation bet middle or bottom pair on the flop. You'll just let it check behind. And then um, your opponent is always going to check call middle or bottom pair for the most part, right? So they have all the middle pairs and you do not. So that's the spot where you need to do a lot of checking. Also, when the turn completes a lot of your opponent's draws, you're going to want to check behind as well. Like say you raise under the gun in the big blind calls and it comes seven, five, three. You bet they call turns a four. You have basically no sixes in your under the gun range, whereas they have some sixes in their range. So that's the spot where you really lack the nut advantage. And for that reason, you check it back a ton. Very interesting, says Eves. Yeah, very interesting. I do my best to make it all interesting and fun for all of you. Will the U.S. Poker Open be televised? It was televised last year. Uh, I don't know if it'll be televised again this year. I I think, this is just what I think, I could be wrong, that PokerGo has a deal with Peacock, a streaming network, NBC streaming network, and I think they're putting a lot of the stuff on there, although I could be wrong about that. Um, but it'll definitely be on the PokerGo website you have to pay 10 bucks a month or something like that to watch poker go but if you like poker and you want to watch the newest episodes of all the live poker shows poker goes the way to do it okay anyway here is roughly a what is that get that out of here here's roughly a flow chart showing how you should play on various scenarios so good turns we betting frequently Neutral turns me betting, uh, you know, decent amount, 40, 60%. Bad turns me betting pretty infrequently. And in terms of sizing, if you have the nut advantage, you're usually going to want to be, you have to ask, do you have the nut advantage? If the answer is yes, how well is the opponent's range connect with the board? They have a lot of really good hands, but that you still beat. If they do, you want to bet big. If they do not, you usually want to bet small. If you do not have the nut advantage and you're going to still continue betting, you usually want to bet small. Can you let us know when to watch for you? Of course, follow me on Twitter, at Jonathan Little. I'm sure I'll send an email if I final table any of these tournaments. You're confused the difference between a min raise and a three bet. A minimum raise means you're raising to the minimum amount, whatever that is. Usually pre-flop, it'd be two times the big blind. 
if no one else is putting money in the pot. A free bet means you're putting in the third bet. It's a confusing term. So if someone raises and you want to re-raise to any amount, that is the third bet. This is a term that comes from an old antiquated game called Limit Hold'em. The big blind was the first bet. The initial raise was the second bet. And the re-raise is the third bet. They decided to keep that term for No Limit Hold'em. So anyway, the three bet is the re-raise. That's all it is. A three bet is the same thing as a re-raise. So if you know what a re-raise is, you know what a three bet is. And then a re-re-raise would be a four bet. And a re-re-re-raise would be a five bet. Okay? The, the three bet does not say anything about the size. All right, let's take a look at a few examples. This chart here shows the equity of you. We'll discuss who you is when you take this line on all possible terms, okay? So let's say, low jack versus big blind. So you raise low jack, which is under the gun six-handed. Big blind calls, flop comes ace, jack, five, two spades. Big blind checks, you continuation bet small, opponent calls. Turn, here's a turn. This would be two of clubs, this would be four of diamonds, this would be nine of diamonds, this would be queen of hearts, etc. Notice you can't have these cards that are blanked out because those cards are all on the board. Okay, limit is still viable in LA. Look, whenever I say a game is antiquated, I mean it is not nearly as popular as it used to be and it is not played very often at all in most places, okay? I don't mean the game's totally dead, but I mean it is substantially less popular than the most popular games, like No Limit Texas Hold'em. And I realize there are some pockets of the world where these games are super popular. Like for example, in um, Atlantic City, they like seven card stud. Why? I don't know. But they like seven cards stud there. The game's still antiquated, in my opinion, but they like seven cards stud there. Some places they like uh, Badesi. You know, why? I don't know. That's just how they do it. But you have to ask, what is the purpose of learning to play a game? And in my mind, I'm trying to learn to make money. I'm trying to teach all of you to make money. And a really good way to uh, put yourself at risk of not being able to make money in the future is by playing a game that has relatively few games available. A long time ago, I learned this concept. I met a guy on a poker trip. He was so proud of himself because he was the biggest winner in Pot Limit Omaha Sit and Goes. I looked him up, he had a huge ROI, like 80%. He was smashing them. Problem was, he got to invest about $200 per day because no games ran. It was a game that didn't even really exist. He did a little bit on one site, kind of like, you know, there's a little bit of limit holding on the, on the, in LA. There's a little bit of seven card stud on the East Coast, but he wasn't getting to invest much money. And the thing is, even if he was getting to invest a lot of money, the games will die eventually, right? Just because player pool is small and the game's not all that popular. And you have to be very careful spending a lot of time learning skills like that because they may not be useful in the future. You want to make sure you learn skills that may be viable in the future, unless of course you're just playing for fun. All right, so, in this spot, we continuation bet the flop with our entire range, pretty much, and the opponent calls with mo only good hands. When we bet flop and they call, they're going to fold out all their random stuff like 8-7 of clubs, right? Whereas we may still e easily have 8-7 of clubs in our range if we raise it pre-flop. So, this is a situation where we are going to have to understand that even though we do have a lot of ace x and jack x in our range, so does our opponent. This is also a board where they're going to overfold a lot compared to minimum defense frequency. So, notice we have basically 50% equity on all these boards, right? Notice the jack is particularly bad because we may check back some jacks, whereas they're always going to check call the jacks. Five's not particularly great. Low cards are interesting because uh, they're going to have a lot of like ace two type stuff. I got to presume we don't, unless they're going to have random gut shots every once in a while. Um, why is the ace bad, asks Stu. Because then they're going to have a lot of jacks in their range, right? So like the, essentially when an ace comes, the equity of a jack goes up, right? And they're going to have a lot of jacks to check call. So when the ace comes, it's less likely we have an ace, right? Because there's an additional one on the board. So that makes, makes their jacks and their fives and all their lower pairs stronger. Okay? So just looking at this equity and considering this flow chart, there really aren't all that many good cards for us. So if there are not all that many good cards for us, we're going to be doing a decent amount of checking, Right? probably betting about half the time, checking about half the time. And it turns out, that's exactly what we do. Notice we do a lot of checking and a lot of um, very little betting. And when we do bet, we're usually betting on the bigger side. 
One exception is the ace and the flush cards, because then we do have some super nuts that don't really care if the opponent sticks around, right? Like if you if an ace does come and you are sitting here with an ace, you don't really care what odds you give your opponent. And if a flush comes and you're sitting here with a flush, you don't really care what odds you give your opponent. And you want to make sure you're not betting so big into your opponent who could easily have the nuts themselves, right? So you want to make sure whenever you are bluffing, you lose the least amount. On the lower cards, I usually be betting very polarized, um, over betting the size of the pot, which a lot of people do not do. If the turn comes like a random six, when you are betting, you often want to be betting very big because if you do have a hand like ace king, that hand is almost always best, but it's very vulnerable, right? So on those cards, you usually want to be betting on the big side. We could go through and show some uh, implementable strategies for how I would do this. Notice this range is pretty tight. This presumes a low jack raising range that continuation bets the flop, and then we get to the turn. Notice this had us checking back some kings and queens and king jack type hands. So, and the range was pretty tight to begin with. So, as you see on the turn, we're going to keep betting pretty often, but with our premium hands that are almost always good and some draws, mainly flush draws on the six of clubs turn, king, queen, and queen 10 for draws. And they were checking back some of the ace X, right? So, and uh, some, some uh, garbage that's no good. If we look at the GTO strategy here, we see the same thing, over betting 125% pot with our absolute best hands and a lot of draws like king, queen, and queen 10, right? Uh, notice GTO actually uses hands like eights and sevens as bluffs sometimes, which is kind of neat. King 10 bluffs a lot. These king X are a lot of spades. So you see, pretty common spot. 10 of spades turn. This is a turn where we have to not bet quite so often because the opponent's going to have some flushes. It's actually a corner case when there's uh, an ace of spades on the board and there are three spades on the board or, you know, hearts or whatever. But if the ace or like an ace and another high card are on the board, that's the spot where the opponent actually has a lot of the flushes and you don't because you don't actually raise all that many king x suited and queen x suited preflop, whereas they have all of them in their range or a lot of them in their range. So this is a spot where we'll be doing a decent amount of checking. As we see, GTO does check. And when we do bet here, we bet small because we're betting into a lot of nut hands from our opponent when they do happen to have the flush. Okay. Let's take a look at a different spot. Let's take a look at um, 975. Okay. So here, we raise the button with a pretty loose range. Big blind calls. Flop comes. 975. They check. We continuation bet two-thirds pot. They call. What do a lot of our bluffs look like on this board? And also importantly, what does the opponent's check calling range look like? Scott says, only 29 likes? Come on, everyone. If you enjoy the show, click like, click subscribe. I would appreciate it. This is a spot where a lot of your bluffs are going to be just like random overcards, right? Like king, queen, queen, jack, jack, 10, stuff like that. So you see in this scenario that the overcards are actually pretty good for us. And you also see, alternatively, that the low cards are all pretty bad for us. What's the name of this solver? This solver is called Pio Solver. You have to buy it. It's kind of expensive. There are other solvers. Munker Solver is, I think, thought to be pretty much the best one. There are various poker sites out there now that have like pre-input GTO solutions, but I would tell you to be careful with those. A lot of those have been proven by my team to just be not accurate because they don't run the simulation long enough. So anyway, um, we have a lot of the common spots discussed at pokercoaching.com in our classes. I mean, this course right here goes through a ton of these spots. So if you're not studying poker a ton, I would recommend just going through all the common spots like we already have covered at pokercoaching.com. Um, okay, so this is a spot where Looking at this, you should already know that when we bet these high card turns, we're probably going to be betting using a slightly smaller size than when we bet these low card turns because we're going to be betting more polarized on these low card turns, right? And again, like you can kind of visualize this in your head when you're playing. You know I'm betting the flop with like queen jack type stuff as bluffs. Therefore, those cards will be pretty good. Um, and we're not going to be betting all that often on any card because... Like if a random queen does come, we sell the whole lot of just nothing, right? With like random ace, jack, and stuff like that. So let's take a look. As we see, when we do bet the high card turns, we use a smaller size than we do when we bet the low card turns. Um, notice the cards that are really bad for us, like a seven and a five and an eight and a six. We really don't bet all that often, right? I mean, we're betting some, but not all that often. Actually, we're betting more than I would have like naturally thought. 
but you do see still a decent amount of checking there. But on the overcards, we're doing a pretty good amount of betting. Notice the 10 and the jack and the queen are particularly good for us because we're going to be betting a whole lot of jack 10, queen jack, queen 10, stuff like that. Kind of surprised we don't bet the ace more often. I guess because we check back a lot of ace high, right? So I suppose that does make some sense. Let's take a look at the GTO strategy on a two. A stone brick two. Notice our range is much wider than the previous example because here we have... Um, we're raising from the button, right? Notice we check back a lot of these ace highs on the flop like I alluded to. So we don't actually have a ton of aces, which is why we would check back on some aces a lot. But we do have a lot of king high, queen high, jack high, right? Like I mentioned. Okay, so on the two, what are we continuing to bet? We're going to be betting our best made hands and our draws. We're going to be pretty polarized. And again, over betting a lot. This is something a lot of people do not do. A lot of people, when they play cash games, just always half pot it or always two thirds pot it. And that is a pretty big error. Because, as you see, GTO, when I give it 120% pot bet size, a two-thirds pot bet size, and a 25% pot bet size, it basically only bets big. Maybe even bigger is ideal. <laughs> we do have found that 120% pot's often like the pretty ideal sizing. But whenever you are betting very polarized, you typically do want to bet big. Because you want to put your opponent's likely hands, like a seven and a five, in a pretty bad spot, right? If you bet half pot or a third pot or two-thirds pot, they can just easily call it. It's not a problem. But whenever you start blasting it, it puts them in a pretty bad spot. So what are we betting with? Betting our best hands. That's going to be our good top pairs and better. So as we see, that is about right. We see jack nine and better betting basically every time. Over pairs betting. We're not betting a whole lot of middle pairs, as you see. But almost no middle pairs. Almost no bottom pairs. Uh, and then we're betting our draws. Our draws can be hands containing a an eight or a six or like two over cards, right? So we see a lot of sixes betting. We see a lot of eights betting, and we see jack-10, queen-jack, queen-10, king-jack, king-10, still doing a decent chunk of betting, which makes sense, right? Notice our best ace highs are going to be checking it back as well, and um, that's pretty much it. Notice ace-4 down here is a gut shot. We bet that one a lot. Kind of surprised we're not betting even like ace-3 and ace-4 every time, but, you know, whatever. I think that's fine. And, and notice again the big bet size. Big bet size is quite important here. Will they call a turn bet with a seven or five using a smaller and medium size bet on the flop? Well, we bet two thirds pot on the flop because we're already betting kind of polarized to begin here, right? We're already betting kind of polarized to begin here. So when we bet kind of polarized to begin here, we're already putting the seven and a five in a pretty bad spot. And then when we bet polarized on the turn, we're gonna continue blasting. Why aren't sets in any of your examples? Because, uh, where are the sets? We have sets, what do you mean? Sets right here, set of sevens. We bet it almost every time. Set of fives, we bet it almost every time. We do check back sometimes. You want to make sure your check back range is well protected with hands that are the least likely to get outdrawn. And that's going to be sets, right? Notice we don't have all of our straights either because we check back some straights sometimes. So we check back some. Um, I'm saying if not betting a big size. Well, if you don't bet a big size, yeah. I mean, a seven and a five should definitely not fold here. Are, are you kidding? If we bet small on the turn... We're giving our opponent way better pot odds, right? And if we bet, give our opponent way better pot odds, they can't go around folding any seven for sure. And five probably can't even fold. Now, your opponents may fold. I, I will say, some of you are saying that I find that in these pots, my opponents do this way too much, et cetera, et cetera, right? If that's the case, sure, right? Like, exploit your opponents. You should always take advantage of what they're doing correctly, but it's very important to consider your opponent's tendencies. Right? It says you mean sets on the turn. Sevens bets every time. Red means bet. Green means check. We're betting sevens every time. We're betting fives every time. We bet nines most of the time. You'll find the top set is a hand that does slow play sometimes. Like if there is a hand that slow plays on kind of uncoordinated boards. Notice there's no flush draws here. Um, this is a spot where we're doing that every time. Does the turn bet have anything to do with the perception we're trying to leverage our stack? No. I mean, so look, this idea of trying to create a narrative and a story, the GTO strategy does not think about that at all. GTO strategy doesn't care about any of that. GTO strategy is just trying to make the most profitable play in each scenario based on the parameters we have set, which are these ranges, right? And yeah, we want to, I mean, you may think of it as a narrative, but the computer is not thinking, oh, I need to create a story here. The computer's thinking, I want to bet with my best hands to get all my money in and to get protection, and I want to bet with my draws to uh, balance that out, right? 
Well, let's take a look at the Jack of Diamonds. Jack of Diamonds is one of those over cards that's going to connect pretty well with our flop bets, right? You kind of look here and realize we had a lot of these hands. So we're going to have a lot of good but non-premium hands on the turn, which means we're going to be doing a lot of decently small betting on the Jack of Diamonds turn. As you see, Jack of Diamonds turn, lots of small betting. Notice now our draws are going to be a lot of hands containing a 10 and an 8. So we kind of check back some of these 6s now. They're like the weakest draw. So we don't necessarily need to be betting those. We are betting a lot, though. Those are only checking 24% of the time in this scenario. So not all that often. Whenever the turn is really good for you, or pretty good for you, you definitely want to keep betting somewhat frequently. All right, all right, all right. We talked about this for about 30 minutes. Let's discuss facing a turn continuation bet. What if we're 1,000 big blinds deep? It's going to play similarly. Probably just use bigger bet sizes. Play more aggressively with your polarized range. Play more cautiously with your marginal made range. All right. Facing a turn continuation bet. This is when somebody raises, you call on the flop, you check, they bet, you call, or they raise, you call in position, they bet, you call. When you call the flop, you lose all of the junk out of your range. That means you're going to have a lot of marginal made hands, but also you lose a lot of the nuts from your range because you're going to raise a lot of the nut hands on the flop. This is important to make sure you um, slow play a little bit, but not, not too much. So you always want to use the facing a bet response flow charts. I see a lot of you having various solver questions. Louis Philippe, who runs the Poker Coaching Study Session, says to check out the study session you do after this show. Louis Philippe is happy to help you there. He runs the Poker Coaching Study Sessions. does an amazing job. The Sharks are crushing it. So make sure you get in there. Uh, they, they use the solvers all the time and learn to play great. All right. Facing a bet, what kind of hand do you have? If you have junk, fold. If you have a marginal made hand, call. If you have a premium hand or a draw, you want to ask, do I have the nut advantage? If you do not, do a lot of calling. Still some raising, but do a lot of calling. If you have the nut advantage, you're going to want to do a lot of raising. You're typically going to call a little bit more when you're in position, raise a little bit more when you're out of position. Very common spot. What is a polarizing range? A polarized range means you have a really good hand or usually a draw that cannot win at the showdown if it does not improve, typically. Um, so whenever you are applying aggression, you want to be polarized for the most part because in that scenario, you put your opponent in a spot where they don't know if you have a really good hand or a really bad hand. Tough no limit link is broken. All right, should probably fix that. I don't actually know how to. <laughs> There's any mods here on Twitch. Fix that for me. <laughs> All right, um, here's a few adjustments for facing a turn continuation bet. Um, when you're in position, you're going to realize your equity well. So you're going to find that when you're in position facing a turn continuation bet, you got to realize your opponent should be pretty polarized, right? As we just showed. So if they're pretty polarized, you in turn don't need to be raising all that often. However, if you're out of position, we didn't actually go through those spots, but if you are out of position, they're going to be a little bit less polarized to some extent. And um, you're also going to have a difficult time realizing your equity, especially with your draws when you hit from out of position. So that's going to result in you wanting to do a little bit more raising from out of position. Also, the larger the turn bet, the less often you should check raise because your opponent should be more polarized. As we just saw in the previous examples, when we're betting big on the turn, usually it's very, very polarized. So if our range is very, very polarized when we bet, the opponent should not raise at all. But when we're betting smaller, it's usually with a range that contains a more uh, a linear range, right? Of just like a lot of pretty good hands. Like on that 975 turn jack, we have a lot of hands like queen jack, right? If you bet queen jack and get check raise, it's a pretty dicey spot. So... You're going to find that facing an overbet, you almost never raise, but against the smaller bet sizes, you should start raising some, especially out of position. All right, let's take a look at a very common spot. Low jack versus big blinds. Low jack raises, big blind calls, flop comes ace, jack, five. Make sure you enjoy your brain fuel. Check it out at brainfuel.com. You can use code pokercoaching to get a little discount. Woo, it'll make me go good all day. All right, ace, jack, five. Big blind checks, they bet... We're the big blind. They bet a third pot, we call. On the turn, as you see, equities are kind of close. You know they're betting kind of polarized. So let's say the turn's a six, and they bet 125% pot. Okay? We're out of position, so we should not do, we should be doing some raising, but notice when they're betting very big, we basically never raise, as I just said a second ago. And it turns out the GTO strategy basically never raises 4.62% of the time, which is almost none. So, what are we doing in this spot, facing the overbet? Actually, a lot of folding. 
Somebody asked earlier, whenever if, if they bet smaller, do we call stuff like middle pairs? The answer is yes, but notice when they bet big, we see stuff like ace nine, ace eight, ace seven in this spot, folding. Seems nitty, I know. <laughs> I, I probably don't play quite GTO in this spot, but to be fair, most people don't blast the turn. They just bet third pot or half pot or three-fourths pot, and that lets you easily get to the showdown with your hands like ace nine. But whenever they start blasting it, assuming they are playing a good, strong low jack strategy, which includes raising most of their good hands, you, in turn, have to start folding a lot. Cha says, the best free content on YouTube. Well, I appreciate it. If you all enjoy the show, do me a favor. Click the like and subscribe button. If you want a lot more of the content, check out pokercoaching.com slash free. Glad you enjoy my work. I appreciate it. We put a lot of effort into it. It's not just me. We have a big team. We have a big team of people who help make the content, who uh, help with support, help make the website. It's a big, big job, but I'm happy to do it for all of you. I'm glad I have the opportunity to do it. And uh, you give me an opportunity to help a lot of people, I'm happy to do that. Okay, facing a big bet. Lots of folds. Lots and lots and lots of folds. Um, what are we raising? Well, we're raising with sets of jacks. Sixes and fives when we have it. Ace jacks sometimes, and that's it, right? Essentially, hands that beat our opponent's strong polarized range. If your opponent's polarized, you in turn only get to raise with hands that crush their polarized range. Plus a few bluffs that are, you know, marginal. And our marginal bluffs here are going to be 9-8 for a gut shot. 9-7 with for a gut shot. <laughs> That's it. Um, you may ask, why not raise a hand like King-10 for a gut shot? Because, does anybody know why? Why would you fold King-10 but call 9-8? I'm going to presume these are spades. Maybe we don't have King-10 of spades. We must, must, why don't we fold? We would never fold King-10 of spades, obviously. You're getting crushed no matter what. Well... Quite often, it means you're playing poorly. Post hands in the Poker Coaching Discord. We have a vibrant community there, people who are happy to help you succeed. Whenever you have a hand like 9-7, I gotta presume these are spades. But whenever you have a hand like 9-7, you lack showdown value, right? But also, you do not block the most obvious bluffs for your opponent, because your opponent's gonna likely continue bluffing in this spot with hands like King Jack, or King 10, hands like King 10 and Queen 10. So whenever you have a hand like 9-7, you don't block any of those hands at all. But when you have a hand, a hand like King-10, you do block the King-10 type stuff, which means your opponent's more likely to have a value hand. Okay? Anyway, though, lots of folding here. I think this is a spot where most people do not fold nearly often enough, myself included. I remember when I first saw this chart, I'm like, this has to be a mistake. But no, turns out it's right. Whenever you are facing a 125% pot bet in a spot where your opponent has a lot of nuts and you don't, you in turn have to fold a lot because... You're going to under-realize your equity a lot of the time. Let's take a look at on Ace, Jack, 5, 10, two spades. Same spot we take, took a look at a minute ago. Facing a tiny bet. Facing a 25% pot bet. Facing a 25% pot bet, you see we fold almost never. Right? That said, funny enough, we actually do still fold out some Ace-X here. Why are we folding Ace-X on Ace, Jack, 5, 10, three spades? Well, because now we have a whole lot of better hands in our range, if you think about it, right? We have a lot of flushes down here that want to raise. So we have a lot of flushes. We have some um, various straights, two pairs, etc. So we have a lot of pretty good hands in this spot. Also, a lot of our hands like Jack-10 improved to a, to a much better hand. He says, this is a, a new way of looking at turn bet sizing as a strategy to optimize return. Well, yeah, I mean, this has been on PokerCoaching.com for the last year or so. Um, this is actually part of my tournament masterclass. All right, this is the Cash Game Masterclass. We have a tournament masterclass as well discussing how to play a shallower stack. 20 big blinds and 40 big blinds. We go through all the common spots. This is slide uh, 435 of the post-flop section of the Cash Game Masterclass. And I would definitely recommend you check it out if this kind of thing is either very enlightening to you or new to you, etc. We recently sent a, poker, a couple of poker coaching hats and uh, patches. Good. Well, you must have given us your email or your address. Otherwise, I couldn't have sent it to you. You took 18th out of 1,600 people. Good job, good work in the Encore. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. You never face 125% pot bet. Yeah. You want to know why? Because your opponents are not very good. <laughs> A lot of players are just not good. I mean, I'm thinking back to when I used to play 5, 10, and 10, 20, no limit at Bellagio every single day. I literally never face an overbet. And if I did, it was from just like the super nuts every time. I was probably the only person back then making overbets, and I wasn't even doing it right. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, a lot of people just don't play very well. 
So anyway, as you see against a tiny bet, we do need to continue way more often, folding 20% of the time. And notice though, that 20% of the time does include stuff like some bad aces. How do you get a hat? If you're a poker coaching member, email me at support at pokercoaching.com. Simple as that. They're free for members. Zero dollars. I, you know, you know what really tilts me? It tilts me whenever I pay good money to someone for something, and then they still want to nickel and dime me. <laughs> I cannot comprehend how, if you're like a poker coaching premium member, you're paying me whatever, 50 bucks, 100 bucks a month, whatever it is, depending on how long you sign up. If you're going to pay me $50 a month or $60 a month for a year, $600, I, I can send you a $30 hat. Simple as that. I mean, with my NFT series, Deck of Degeneracy, something that really, uh, really tilts me is that with a lot of these NFT series, they want to charge you for things like merchandise, despite the fact that you paid some amount of money for the product, for the NFT. A digital thing that costs nothing to produce or close to nothing to produce. Well, with this NFT series, we send you a physical deck of cards featuring these, this art. We haven't made it yet, but we will send that to you. If you think these are cool decks of cards, feel free to get in. Val Kilmer, of all people, the other day posted on Twitter that he loves these cards and that he, uh, he's, he, got, he signed up just to get the physical deck of cards. Can get the hat sent abroad. I don't know. Send us an email. Support at PokerCoaching.com. We'll try to help you out. I mean, look, if you're a longtime Poker Coaching member, I'm happy to hook you up. I, I highly value you. <laughs> and if you want a hat and you're going to wear my hat, I'm happy to give you a hat. Simple as that. Okay, so facing small bets, as you see, we do a whole lot of calling. Noting, though, that even stuff like top pair on this board is actually kind of low in our range. You took down the $1 hyper for 78 bucks. Good job. I actually ran super hot in hyper turbo tournaments or turbo tournaments for a long time on uh, Poker Stars. They used to have like these nightly, or what were they? I think they had like $88 six handed hyper tournaments. And there was like a, a period where I won like one every single Sunday. It was ridiculous. It's like, yeah, I'm the best hyper player in the world, but obviously, you know, you're just kind of getting hit by the deck, but it's like, <laughs> it was a lot of fun. All right, all right, all right, all right. Saeed says, huge thanks to Louis Philippe. Yeah, huge thanks to Louis Philippe. I appreciate all the work Louis Philippe does with the poker coaching study sessions. Make sure you get in those. You think you're going to get that NFT? Well, I mean, if you want a piece of my tournament action or at least a, a shot to it, uh, yeah. When you mint a card, is it chosen randomly? Yes, it is minted randomly. I'll show you what it looks like right now if you go to, uh, let's see. If you go to Je Deck of Degeneracy on OpenSea, you'll see this is what you have right now. All of these people have these cards, and they are random. They are not, they are not minted yet. But we will reveal the card tomorrow, actually. Tomorrow, probably 10 a.m. You'll go back to OpenSea, you'll click the refresh link, and then it will show you which card you have. And then tomorrow, I'm going to be drawing a card out of a deck. Just like this. We're going to get this deck. I'm going to pick a card. Way more, less clumsy than that. Say it's the three of clubs. It's not actually three of clubs. I'm going to draw it officially tomorrow. If you have the three of clubs, you're going to get 1% of my $10,000 buy-in tournament I'm playing tomorrow. Or on uh, the 16th. And then the next day, or the day after, I'm playing another 10K, and another 10K, and a 15K, and a 25K, and a 25K, and a 50K. We're going to be giving away a lot of tournament action. If you have the card, you get a percent. If you don't have the card, well, you're live for the next one. So anyway, check it out, deckofdegeneracy.com. We have a vibrant Discord as well. Make sure you get in the Deck of Degeneracy Discord. There's a link right here. So get in that. Also, if you collect a Royal Flush, which will be easier than you think because they're jokers, um, I'm throwing a party in Vegas this summer at the World Series of Poker. I threw a party last summer at the World Series of Poker for people who had my other NFT series. And it was a lot of fun, and we're going to do the same thing, but better and longer. So um, you can use a joker to make a royal flush. And if you make a royal flush, you will be invited to the private party in Las Vegas. Also, there are gold cards. One out of the 50 decks is gold, which gives you twice the utility. So if you have the gold, four of clubs, when I draw the four of clubs, you get 2%. You're loving the NFTs. Well, I'm glad to hear it. I'm working with Wes Henry, an amazing artist. He gets in there. He does great work. Jeff Jing and William K. Jeff's dad, actually, is a poker coaching member. Hooked me up with him. Young developer who did great work. So anyway, check it out. If you like me, if you like um, sweats, 
it'll be a lot of fun. Love from India. Hello, hello. All right, let's take a look at 975. Button raises, big blind calls. Flop comes 975. We check, button bets, two-thirds pot, big blind calls. This is the exact opposite spot that we saw recently. Now, we know on the turn, we're going to have a good amount of equity on all the low cards. And we're going to have a marginal amount of equity on the higher cards, right? The, the opposite of the spot we saw earlier, right? So these numbers are 100 minus this number for the other earlier spot. So let's take a look at 9752, facing 125% pot bet. Remember, remember, facing the 125% pot bet, we basically never raise. And as you see, that is correct, according to GTO. We basically never raise versus the big bet. Okay? And you will see, facing the big bet, we actually do start folding out a whole lot of our draws. And we only continue with our pretty good hands because we are facing such a big bet. Um, notice a lot of the sevens are folding. I mean, sorry, a lot of the sixes are folding. A lot of the eights are folding. Um, pairs with draws don't go around folding all that much. Hands like eights and sixes fold because they, while they do have a gut shot, the sets are sometimes not good. But, but really just a, like a lot of folding, a lot of folding, right? Notice we don't fold top pair. We don't really fold middle pair. Okay. Interesting to see the ace seven folding. Take a second and think, why would the ace seven fold? Why would the ace seven fold, but not the queen seven and the jack seven? Hmm. Well, interestingly enough, pocket aces for the opponent checks back a lot on the turn when they have it here, compare uh, more often, which means they're not betting with the aces very much. Whereas whenever you have king seven, you block kings and kings is a hand that will be betting. It's probably enough to make it happen. Kind of a weird spot, weird corner case. You'll find GTO does some kind of weird things like this every once in a while, and they're kind of hard to explain unless you know exactly what the opponent's tendencies look like, or the opponent's strategy looks like. But anyway, a lot of folding facing the big bet, right? It's fine. If your opponent blasts it, you should be folding a lot. Now, if your opponent won't fold a lot, then clearly your strategy should change a bit. All right, what about 975 Jack? This is a pretty bad turn for us, but the opponent's betting smaller, right? In this spot, the opponent bets two-thirds pot with a wider range. So if they're betting two-thirds pot with a wider range, what do we do? Well, now we're going to be raising some with our best hands and our draws, right? So what are our best hands here? It's going to be stuff like queen 10 if we have it, which we don't actually, because we would have folded that to the flop bet. Uh, so if we don't have queen 10, wait, queen 10, that was saying, not queen 10, 10, 8. <laughs> we do have 10, 8. 10, 8 raises every time. Jacks raises every time, or Jack nine raises a lot. Nines raise a lot. Sevens and six, sevens and fives raise a lot. Which all makes sense. Eights does not fold now because it's double gut shot, right? Uh, notice some bottom pair type hands opt to do some bluffing, which is something you see GTO does a decent amount of the time. Um, like ten five is a hand that probably can like barely profitably call. As we see, like queen five does a decent amount of folding. Um, so. And like 5-3 does a decent amount of folding. So 10-5 probably should fold a lot of the time, but it does have a gut shot. So you can either call it or put in a little raise, which is fun. A lot of folding though. I'm sorry, a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of raising compared to the previous spot, even though this is a card that should be a little bit better for the opponent because even though they do have a range advantage to some extent, uh, they are betting on the smaller side and they're betting more frequently. When they're betting more frequently using a smaller size, we are going to put in the raise more often. Um, do we have time to talk about anything else today? Uh, no, we're running out of time. I actually have a poker coaching webinar happening in 15 minutes, 14 minutes now. So make sure if you're a poker coaching member, you check that out. I want to address this question. Do you think poker is as much based on the greater fool theory, just like NFTs? Well, first things first, I don't think NFTs are based on the greater fool theory if you're smart. For example, my project. We're giving back a large chunk of the money that we bring in in the form of my action, various uh, equity-based things, additional giveaways, home games, right? I know a lot of you say you want to play poker home games with me. Roughly every month, we're going to draw a card out of the deck. There's going to be 50 people who have that card if you sell out. And um, I'm going to run sit and goes, where first place is something like 500 bucks, second is third, $300. Third is $200. We're going to play a nine-handed or ten-handed sit-and-go with the people who hold those cards. It's going to be a lot of fun, right? And so this is more of a ticket than just a piece of art. Now, obviously, art, to some extent, is the uh, greater fool theory, right? Like, like, I got this beanie baby here, this wonderful beanie baby. Somebody 
was willing to pay $1,000 for this thing a long time ago. I bought it for $15. Probably worth nothing soon because my children are going to destroy it. But all, all things like art are very um, subjective. you got to find people who want to buy it from you, assuming you're viewing it as an investment. But I don't necessarily view this as an investment. I view this as an access token, right? Like imagine the Super Bowl. Think about the Super Bowl. Or any sporting event, really. But imagine the Super Bowl. This is an easy one. Whenever the Super Bowl tickets come out, people who are members of that stadium, people who own licensing rights to their seats in their stadium, usually have first dibs on the seats. And usually those are way cheaper than they go on the secondary market. That may happen here. You can mint these for 0.1 ETH. They may go higher, right? So you buy, you buy it from the stadium if you have access. If you don't have access, fine. You can buy it on the secondary market later. Then, once you go to that game, you have to decide, do I want to flip it to somebody else? Say you buy the ticket for $1,000 and the ticket goes up to $5,000. Maybe you want to sell it. Maybe you still want to go to the game. Maybe with me. Maybe you want my equity in the next $50,000 buying tournament. Maybe you don't. Sell it to somebody who wants it. I don't care. It doesn't bother me. Um, maybe you don't want to play a poker home game with me. Maybe you don't want NFTs from Wes Henry. Maybe you don't want... Um, an uncut sheet of the physical cards. Maybe you don't want a tungsten cube with art by Wes Henry on it. Who knows, right? Maybe you don't want these things. Maybe you don't want to come to Vegas to my party. Sell your Royal Flush, right? So you can sell it or you can keep it. If you keep it, you can go there. And then you can do whatever you want when you're there. If you go to the Super Bowl, you can do whatever you want at that Super Bowl event. You can get blackout drunk. You can sweat the game hard. You can you can uh, make TikTok content out of it. You can twerk as much as you like at the game. You can do whatever you want as long as security doesn't give you problems. Then after the game, you're left with this ticket stub. You can sell that ticket stub on eBay. Think about that, right? So say you get this ticket for $1,000. You can probably sell the ticket stub if it was a good game for two or 300 bucks on the back end. To somebody who just, like, who just wants it. Can you take clothes off at the Super Bowl? Um, some of them. At least your socks, right? And your gloves. So anyway... Where do you go to mint these? Deckofdegeneracy.com. I put the link at the bottom of the screen here. So anyway, that'll be a lot of fun. Uh, we're guaranteeing, guaranteeing, because, uh, you know, we're not breaking any rules here. We guarantee we will send you a physical deck of cards for each NFT you mint. We also guarantee there'll be a party in Las Vegas for anyone who owns a Royal Flush. Other things we may be giving, but you know, you know me. May means we're doing it. Pieces to my action, bonus NFTs, uncut sheets of physical cards, like a big piece of art to put on your wall if you want it, right? If you don't want that, sell it too. And you never know what you're going to get. I actually have this, this tungsten dice. Actually, I guess this is a die. I have another one up there. It's a tungsten die. This weighs about two and a half pounds, heavier than you would think for this little tiny thing. It's really cool. It'd be an amazing card protector. I found a company that can put art on the side of it. Like it can etch art into it. So I'm going to have Wes make some sweet art. These are expensive. These cost like 300 bucks. <laughs> Why does Jonathan have a $300 die? I don't know, because it's cool. Um, my, my, my son Thomas loves this. He says, Daddy, can I play with your heavy dice? And then he'll take it and he'll like try to carry it around and he'll randomly drop it on the floor and he'll put a dent in the floor. Anyway, you never know what you're going to get with this project. 816 have been minted out of 2,700 total. We launched it a day, or, a day and a half ago. Will we get to 2700 Maybe. Oh, yeah. Whenever we get to 2700 I'm going to give away a $10,000 buying World Series of Poker seat to one of the 2700 holders. I'm going to draw it randomly. I'll tell you how I'm going to do it. I have these dice right here. These dice. These are regular dice. I'm going to roll these dice. These are 10-sided dice and 8-sided um, dice. I'm going to roll these dice. If it comes up, 1, 6, 4, 2. Whoever has token number 1, 6, 4, 2. Wins $10,000. Seems like fun. I don't know. It's called Deck of Degeneracy. Cannot guarantee anything, but if you enjoy a, a good sweat, that's where you go. Deck of Degeneracy.com. That's me for today. I have to get to my poker coaching webinar. I want to thank all of you for being here. If you want to learn more about NFTs or everything we have going on, make sure you get in the Discord here or follow Degeneracy NFT. On Twitter, I post all of the stuff here on Twitter. So anyway, check that out. 
Good luck in your games. Have fun. Make the most of your opportunity. And I hope you run very, very hot on this fine week. I hope I do too. I'm heading to Las Vegas tomorrow to play the U.S. Poker Open. I will um, definitely be posting updates on Degeneracy NFT on Twitter because um, people there will have a big sweat. Good luck in your games. Have fun. Run hot. If you enjoyed this, click the like and subscribe button. And I'll talk to you.